All right, we're live. Happy Tuesday. <laughs> we are live and happy Tuesday. And I'm going to open with this question just because I thought it was a funny, thought-provoking question that has nothing to do with today's subject. Okay, that's a way to start it. Why um, not? What Who's that dumber, say? Keith Olbermann or Robert De Niro? Dude, it's really close. I mean, you know, I mean, in terms of, uh, well, in terms of Trump derangement syndrome, it's a close call. Um De Niro, I think, was on one of these shows last night and just started frothing at the mouth. I don't know. That's a toss up. I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. All I know is that um, the kid who the kid who was at the Chiefs game who had his face painted the two colors and was cited by the black uh, writer from Deadspin, mm -hmm. uh, they have successfully now sued. Deadspin, which is officially fired everyone and is out of business. Again. Uh, owned by Gawker, by the way. Um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Did you see the video that Portnoy put out, the short video on Twitter? No. It was hilarious. He's leaning back, uh, you know, laying in his pool, and he has a champagne bottle. And he's like, how many times do I have to pull out this bottle for Deadspin? Oh, oh, that's they, fun, They've yeah. been sold. He's like, but I'm going to go for it. And mm -hmm. he's like, he popped it again you know death to those sons of bitches or, or whatever it right was. right 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 why well, their decline i mean it was like a marxist sports website very strange so okay but using that question that question actually was completely wrong it didn't have the format which would be either a cue or the word question followed by a question and oh, for today it's for today right it's and yeah. it had nothing to do with john Connolly. i just thought it was funny and i would bring it up no no that's okay Today, we're going to be talking about John Connolly and his involvement or lack of involvement, however we look at it, of the JFK assassination. I'm sure you all have questions, but also we're opening it to the future because this is a bridge to our subject coming this weekend since Connolly kind of switched teams and started to... Well, not right. Not only did he switch teams, Eric... He, I have a pin, which I'll bring this weekend to Ohio. Uh, remember Democrats for Nixon? Mm -hmm. He was that leader of that. He founded <laughs> that, and he uh, was the head of it. Yep. Um, you mean this thing? Well, there's a pin, yeah, but that's the organization, right? right? Right. He was the head of that, and I think Nixon rewarded him for that um, by making him uh, head of the Treasury Department. Well, you hang out with um, LBJ long enough, you might want to jump to Nixon as well. You know, it's weird because he he uh, went, attacked uh, Humphrey because Humphrey, was, as a vice presidential candidate, um, Humphrey wasn't strong enough uh, pro-war. He he felt, Connolly felt that he wasn't supporting LBJ enough uh, and backing the Vietnam War. And Connolly went at um, uh, Humphrey, oddly enough, Connolly and LBJ became uh, bitter enemies because Connolly was a segregationist and the, blocked all of the great society programs from entering the state of Texas. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. To the chagrin and anger of LBJ. Um, and he moved more and more to the conservative side. Uh, he was an extremely conservative Democrat, and there was a huge wing of that in the uh, Texas uh, political world and LBJ was just a free agent going anywhere he wanted to go politically, but uh, Connolly was not. Connolly was a strict segregationist. He he was anti-union, and of course LBJ was extremely pro-union. Uh, they went at each other at the end there. Interesting, interesting. And there you go. Democrat uh, for Nixon Lodge. I, I don't know what the lodge thing is. What is? Um, I think I'm talking about a little bit later on um, in in. 19th. Oh, that might have been then the. 50s. Yeah, that's not that's that's not the button I have. Okay. Not, okay. Yeah, I'm oh, talking about I'm talking <laughs> about 1972. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's how that's how uh, Connolly ends up as Secretary of the Treasury. Awesome. So let me see. I mean, he's got such a strange career. I mean, he you know obviously he starts out as some of the the, the audience knows. 
as uh, LBJ's campaign manager, and he's just as nefarious as LBJ, and and they are uh, birds of a feather, without a doubt. They may be considered by LBJ and also by Connolly as best friends. They considered each other. But Connolly, you know, would say that LBJ never read a book in his life. I mean, he would undermine him in interviews. Uh, I, maybe he was already dead when the interviews came out, but... Um, uh, of course, LBJ doesn't last past 1972. But yeah, I mean, they, they are in the Navy together. They come to Hollywood together. They get these uh, uh, custom-made naval suits together, tapered and 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 altered in Hollywood. They go to a professional photographer here in Hollywood. They're they're this. Those are the suits, and that is one of the uh, professional f- photographs they had made of each other. And together, apparently, uh, by a Hollywood studio here on leave from the Navy during the war. So apparently they had time to to fight the Japs and go to Hollywood and party. Yeah, no kidding. Anybody have any questions? That's interesting. I haven't seen any questions come in yet. Let me check Rumble. Well, you, as you're looking around, I'll just tell you this. He He's under Forrestal in the, in the war. And he's later, as Secretary of the Navy, sends the USS Forrestal uh, to Greece and uh, the Middle East to do American diplomacy. Kind of weird to work under the guy, and then the guy jumps out a window, and uh, the ship gets named after him. It's just uh, an interesting thing. Jumped out of which window? I, I, I think I missed this one. <laughs> we'll, on. we'll get into it later, but yeah, we'll demonstrations talk always an interesting I, subject. I, yes, I'd rather not bring it up because of the venue that we're on. So we'll just skip that right now. Yeah, we use terms like defenestration because they sound. I can't so even nice. say that from the administration. <laughs> the <laughs> defenestration of the administration. Right. Well, it's funny because every time we discuss Connolly. I go back to the original idea, which I had as a kid, that um, Connolly was shot by someone else. And that's really based on the angle of the wounds of Connolly. And and I've said this for years. Finally, some people are coming around to this, that uh, somebody shot Connolly and uh, it didn't come from the Dow Tex building and it didn't come from the sixth floor window. And uh, the angle of the bullet, there's only one way the bullet could go, and that's straight down. And I believe, and some of us believe, that it came from the roof, rooftop of the Texas School Book Depository. Of yeah, which, that makes sense. yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about this in the in the in the Connolly episode, uh, but the wound that goes through Connolly's back comes out mid chest, straight down into his you know wrist and 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 thigh. Uh, the angle of it is almost 90 degrees, Eric. And and nobody, and I've talked to Jim about this, Diogenio and others, nobody seems to find this of interest uh, except for me. Uh, <laughs> but that's not unusual in this, in this uh, 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 subject matter. And, you know, I just talk it up. And I've talked to Vince about it. I've talked to others about it. And uh, a lot of people, it's not their ballywick, um, but... You know, because they get into 399 and the amount of shrapnel that's in Connolly's leg is more than that's missing, which is all fine because I don't profess that he was hit by 399. Mm-hmm. So 399 doesn't interest me in in terms of Connolly. Um, the bullet that went through Connolly ends up in his thigh. And that literally comes from the rooftop of which uh, there used to be footage and people that know what I'm talking about. Um of the police, the Dallas police coming down from the rooftop from uh, on the fire escape with a gun, a what appeared to be a uh, 302 British Enfield uh, removed from the rooftop and not the shotgun. They're sitting, they, people say that they're uh, uh, <clears throat> looking at in a photo when they're in a circle at the bottom. There was video footage of them bringing down what appears to be from the roof underneath the hurt sign. Uh, a 302 British Enfield. The reason that weapon is important is because there was exact same weapon owned by uh, Buell Wesley Frazier that was confiscated, according to the records, from his home uh, next door to the Payne house and uh, with stocks of ammo. Now, the thing about Frazier was, unlike Oswald, Frazier did go every week to a rifle range in Dallas. He was a marksman. 
He did have a 302 British Enfield in his closet. He did have tons of ammo. He was charged with the murder of the president. He was lie detected twice. And I believe he's the one who shot Connolly. Uh, that's just my hunch. I can't prove it, but that's just my theory. That's the dots that I have regarding Connolly and how he got shot. Now, Frazier surprisingly goes down in the basement of the Texas School Book Depository to eat lunch. Uh, never did it before, never did it again. No one knows why he did it. He disappears into the into the building and uh, I believe somehow ended up on the rooftop. There's a lot of different uh, uh, ways to get around that building, Eric, as you noticed when we were in there. And, and you know, I think that Frazier was able to somehow work his way to the rooftop and get back downstairs somehow in all the chaos, leaving the rifle on the rooftop. Yeah, well, there have to be a lot of ways to get around because it's it's like a warehouse. You, yeah. You know, all yeah, kinds yeah. of stuff coming up and down, you know. Yeah, everyone's always focused on the elevator and that staircase, but there's it's a, a, a warren of rooms and spaces and floors and offices in there of different people. And, you know, loading docks and things of that nature. If, if you've ever worked in one of those uh, jobs, which I have, uh, there's a lot of places to hide and a lot of places to go. And usually the employees know uh, where they can hide out uh, just from the boss in general or take a nap or take a lunch or whatever. You know, when you, I had summer jobs like that in factories and warehouses and stuff like that. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, all right. So we got a couple of questions that came in, it looks like. Um, well, this is just a super chat. And thank you very much. Mark and Eric have an awesome time in Youngstown. We yeah, that's this. going to be fun. We're going to continue this. We're going to transfer. Connolly is going to come with us as a subject matter over to Youngstown in regards to Watergate. Um, and we'll get into that uh, this weekend um, regarding that. But Connolly is a bridge between the two subject matters for us. I mean, he, he's linked to both areas. I mean, he's linked to the JFK assassination and he's also linked to Nixon and Watergate. Uh, very few people are. He happens to be one of them. He literally switches parties uh, and becomes a the Secretary of the Treasury and is involved in Nixon's shock and getting us off the gold standard, for better or for worse. Uh, that's John Connolly. Yeah, it's, and that, that's part of why we picked the subject for today is because it's leading into the Youngstown meetup. Um, Pamela... Quinnell Edwards Clifton, the big fan of RFK Jr. A lot of names Happy there. Tuesday. Yeah, a lot of Edwards Clifton, Chanel, uh, Pamela. <laughs> the, you, uh, Pamela. Yeah, it's interesting about Connolly because apparently he finds God after the assassination. He becomes a demigod himself in Texas politics because he is a martyr and a victim of the assassination who lives. And um, they take his suit. LBJ orders his suit and shirt. Uh, to be seized from the hospital, why anyone would do that? And he has a, he has them dry cleaned, uh, which is really strange when you think about it. I think his suit is in the museum, right, Eric? We, I think we saw uh, the suit. It's on display there. But the fact that LBJ had it seized and dry cleaned, I, I just would never been able to, to exp understand why or what rational purpose that had other than cleaning evidence i mean the same as cleaning out the limo i'm uh, sure it's just like replacing the windshield yeah yeah it seems like everything needed to be done immediately it's just a there's no rational uh reason for any of this stuff to be happening and yet it does happen yep uh, occam's razor man yeah uh karen vaughn question any further information about well this is not related but Connell's sister-in-law. I'm very we'll talk, we'll talk Friday. about that on we'll Friday. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that on Friday. The the situation with Connolly, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because the as we said in the previous episode about Connolly, he is uh <laughs> LBJ is not happy about the seating arrangement with the two cars. Uh he is he is um uh he has this arch enemy who's the liberal other senator of Texas, Ralph Yarborough. Uh, no relation to Don Yarborough, also Texas politics. But Ralph Yarborough uh, is supposed to sit, according to LBJ, in the jump seat uh, that Connolly eventually sits in. And people have made the, the, the suggestion that possibly LBJ was trying to kill two birds with one stone. His vehemently arch enemy was, was Ralph Yarborough. 
uh, the the liberal senator from uh, uh, Texas, and they hated each other. So the fight that happens in the Texas hotel the night before the assassination, it's actually the day of the assassination, if you want to be technical about it, because it was about 1 or 2 a.m. the morning of the 22nd uh, after they'd been out. The fight was over the seating in the limousine, and Kennedy did not want Ralph Yarborough sitting in that limousine uh, because it didn't help him politically. The reason he wanted to come to Dallas at all was to try to uh, round up uh, conservative Democrats. He didn't need liberal Democrats of Texas. He needed conservative Democrats of Texas to win the state of Texas. And the leader of that group was John Connolly, who was the governor of Texas. So he, LBJ, uh, was told that uh, uh, Connolly's going to sit up there. Well, you would have thought that uh, somebody had had sex with LBJ's mother illegally because he goes ballistic in the Texas hotel. And in fact, Jackie Kennedy said it was the largest argument, the loudest argument she'd ever heard uh, in her life regarding her husband and LBJ. A screaming match ensues at the, in the hotel at 1.30 in the morning, the morning of the 22nd. And uh, uh, Kennedy's not having it. And he will not allow Yarborough to sit in that limo in that jump seat. And Connolly... Um, I guess he was told in the next morning uh, or maybe that night uh, that he would be sitting in, in the death car. Yeah. And uh, that was actually one of the questions. Why did Connolly get in the car? And we don't think he thought that the incident yeah, would happen there. Right. I don't think he thought the incident was going to happen there because the, the as we'll, I'll explain now, he thought, at least this is my perception, uh, he thought that the incident would happen at the trademark uh, where they were really having difficulty, the Secret Service protecting the trademark. Uh, as Jerry Bruno says in his book, The Advance Man, Jerry Bruno was the uh, advance man for all the Kennedy uh, political events uh, for years. Uh, he fought tooth and nail with John Connolly. It's a shot of uh, uh, Jerry Bruno in the middle there. And uh, uh, Barry, who's on the right there? Is that um, um, Bill Barry? Bill Barry. Barry, interestingly enough, um, is featured quite a bit in my RFK script called RFK Must Die. Bill Barry was a retired FBI agent who came to work for the Kennedys and was the personal bodyguard guard of RFK, who is shown on the left there. Bill Barry uh, is, is uh, wrestling in many pictures, trying to hammer the gun out of Sirhan's hand. And on the record said a couple of years later, a year or two later, that he had almost animal superhuman strength, Sirhan. This is from an FBI agent uh, who was not uh, prone to exaggerate uh, and said that he could not. He kept punching him over and over again, Sirhan, and could not get that gun out of his hand. Uh, that's Bill Berry I'm talking about on the right. Uh, but the, the, the campaign trip, the spot that... Uh, I don't. I, I can't really see what this is. Is this, this is the trademark inside, so people can talk? Today, that's it's, today, or it's today. They don't have one oh, oh, inside at the time. So I, yeah, I, right, but it I, shows I, you the catwalks and oh yeah, kind of. So the, the point of the matter was, it was more than the catwalks. What what Connolly wanted to do was to build a triple dais where he would be on top with the president, almost like a Soviet style, uh, regardless of the catwalks. That they would have a three level dais, Eric. Uh, with the president and Connolly on top and then other dignitaries on the second level and the bottom level would be even lower dignitaries. And that's where you wanted to put Ralph Yarborough, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, so besides that, what what uh, Jerry Bruno uh, decided was the the best place to have this event was at the much larger women's building. They wouldn't have to make that turn uh, onto Houston and, and go past the Texas School Book Depository. They would get right on the Stemmons Freeway, go straight onto it without making the right turn, doing that dog leg. Uh, he would be alive today, and everybody admits that, including uh, Kenny O'Donnell. Uh, I don't know, alive today, but he would have been alive after, after Dallas if the women's building was chosen uh, as Jerry Bruno wanted. And... The Secret Service wanted the women's building. You could literally drive the limo, the presidential limo, into the building. Uh, that's how it had a, gates that opened up inside. It held like 4,000 more people. Some of my Texas, uh, Texas friends uh, may be able to explain uh, more of the uh, uh, internal uh, 
uh, visuals of the women's building, but it was huge inside. And what Connolly wanted was just the elites of Texas politics to be inside. And that's one of the reasons he supposedly wanted the trademark. The trademark was brand new. Uh, it was unprotectable by the Secret Service because of those catwalks. The Secret Service uh, backed up uh, uh, Jerry Bruno's decision to use the uh, women's building. Somewhere along the way, it switched. And this is still a mystery. Maybe Vince can answer this, Vince Palomaro, as to what Secret Service agent was involved in the switching. Uh, I, I used to, maybe it was Jerry, it was Jerry Bain, or uh, I used to, I discussed this once with Vince. I, I know there's an answer out there. It's just, um, I, I forget which guy was involved in doing this. But somehow, they were able, at the last minute, uh, a week before the trip to switch the destination of the parade route uh, to the trademark from the women's building. And the speech was prepared and everything was prepared. Now, oddly enough, I thought the barbecue was on Sunday. The barbecue at the LBJ Ranch, Eric, was Friday night. I did not know this until recently, a couple of months ago. And Ralph Yarborough was complaining because it was a fundraiser for Democratic, uh, the Democratic Party of Texas. Let me just explain what I'm talking about. There was a fundraiser scheduled, a huge Texas-style pit barbecue at the LBJ Ranch that night after the, uh, the speech at the trademark, Eric. I thought it was on Sunday. It was Friday night. And there were tickets being sold by uh, the Democratic Party. And the ticket sales were almost nil, zero. And I think the people who were in charge of the tickets knew that there was not going to be a barbecue. Uh, and Yarborough didn't know that. And Yarborough was complaining uh, to uh, the Kennedy people, the advanced people, what the hell's going on with the Friday night ticket sale fundraiser for the Democratic Party at the LBJ Ranch? And there was no answer to that question because the ticket sales were so low uh, that if they did have the event, there wouldn't have been anybody there. Wow. I'm going to try to throw in some locals questions. We'll definitely get to the more locals questions afterward, but I'm going to try to throw some in early here. Mark Swayden Jacket, do you think Connolly might have switched his opinion of LBJ after he let him ride in the death car? Well, it does happen after he rides in the death car, whether what year you want to decide, it goes into 64. Um, there, there is also later on, which we'll get into Watergate, when Spiro Agnew is arrested and there's no vice president, uh, Connolly is rumored to have uh, um, lobbied himself to Nixon, and Nixon was thinking of picking Connolly instead of Gerald Ford. And we might have had a whole different America if Connolly had become vice president instead of Gerald Ford. Now, Gerald Ford is rewarded in a quid pro quo for altering the Warren Commission uh, autopsy sketches. That's his payback. Mm -hmm. And also the, the, the democratic rate, democratically controlled Congress wants the weakest, dumbest, stupidest Republican they could find. Otherwise they would have blocked uh, every single uh, Republican nominee that Nixon could come up with. So that we'll get into that on the weekend in Youngstown, but uh, yeah, Connolly says he, as a, a godlike experience, which is the shooting. I don't know. He says he's chosen by God uh, afterwards. He's God's selected uh, governor. Um, he has some health issues, but later on uh, agrees to work with Nixon and switch his party. So look, I mean, he, they were best friends, but you got, when you, when your friend is a jackal like LBJ and your friend is a psychopath, I mean, how close can you actually be to the guy? They were drinking buddies. They drank together. They sure. stole elections together. They got rolled together in 48 uh, down there, but they came back with, um, you know, the box that had the extra ballots in it. Uh, so they got their revenge, you know, a couple of years later with the Senate race. Uh, but he was he was up to his up to his neck in in election fraud, just like LBJ was. Yeah, and I'm sure very few people knew LBJ better. Than John Connolly. No, no, that's a fact. <laughs> that's an absolute. <laughs> Both sides would admit that. Yeah. I mean, th that would definitely be a factor. Otto sent actually a great question that I'm curious about too. If Connolly had died, who would have become governor? 
Uh, I guess the lieutenant governor, whoever that was. I, I, just I mean, be I interested don't know, I don't know who that is. Governor, I don't know there's who any the lieutenant relevant. governor of Texas was in 1963. I don't know. All right. Now, this is from Earl. It's technically kind of a overall question, but it's a good one. I'm a member. When did that happen? Well, when did what happen? Uh, when did Earl become a member? I just want to tell you. There are some people who are kind enough to buy memberships to the oh, channel, oh, oh, oh. and oh. they gift it to different people. As hmm. a matter of fact, Rocky here gifted 10 America's Untold Stories memberships. Oh, wow. Some people might find themselves becoming members after this. It's very general. Oh, them, oh I see. And, they don't even know they're members. Right. Well, apparently, um, Earl did not know, but Whoa. I did want to explain Ooh. why, because oh, that could be confusing. That's confusing. I'm a member. One Did, day you're nothing, working? and next thing you know, you're a member. <laughs> exactly. So, but thank you both. Uh, Patrick Mersinger, uh, having seen <laughs> many of your JFK videos, was there anyone that day in Dallas who wasn't in on it, or at least appears suspicious? It's only, it's all, I'm sorry, go on. Um, so many people could be in on this and very few talking. Yeah. Mostly, I, I, you know, it just seems that uh, the amateur sleuths, once they find out that uh, someone fill in the blank was there, they all, all, automatically make them a suspect. Uh, it's not, it's just not true. You know, just because you're at a presidential event, you could say the same thing that they were in Houston, uh, these people, you know, but they, it doesn't mean that they're involved in an assassination. Uh, the people in Tampa, the same thing with Chicago, you know, um, but the fact of the matter is there are people in the it's a small group that was involved and uh, a lot of people died who did not talk. Uh, maybe they wanted to talk, but they were eliminated, you know, by the people who were in charge of this thing. Yeah. And I think some people may be suspect because they participated in the cover up or they right. followed orders. After yeah, the yeah, attack. yeah. Yeah. But they didn't necessarily know what was happening. Right. You know, it's all compartmentalized. Getting back to the Connolly thing about getting in the car, I, I think this is, again, this is just my theory. I think Connolly believed that whatever the, the, the assassination attempt was going to be, that it was going to happen at the trademark um, and maybe did not fear getting in that car. Uh, that's the only logical, rational thing I could say. Uh, LBJ fighting to the death to keep him out of that car is just insane. You know, if, if there's, you know what I mean? It's just a, a parade route and you're going to go to the, the, the trade mart and have a speech and blah, blah, blah. What's the difference? Why would you fight to the death over something like that? I mean, he, he gets Connolly. At, this is unbelievable. The vice president of the United States, LBJ, believes that he's going to be co-president. He writes a letter to, uh, to JFK that they're going to be co-presidents. Uh, Bobby Kennedy laughs his ass off and and uh, the, he starts making demands, LBJ. He wants this person for the Supreme Court. He wants this person as, as the secretary of this. And the Kennedys are like, oh, what? But he demands that, that Connolly be given the secretary of the Navy. And the Kennedys uh, allow this. And their graft and corruption of the defense industry continues because Connolly is running the naval budget, which is, I think at that time, like $6 billion in 1963 dollars. And Connolly's in charge the most, the two of them, Con Connolly and LBJ specialized in graft of the defense industry. That was their thing. So putting Connolly in charge of the Navy allowed them to continue their graft uh, of naval uh, uh, acquisitions and naval contracts. And it's astonishing that they allowed that to happen as a demand of LBJ. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Fred Korth, I think, replaces him. And he also is corrupt and is involved in, in uh, uh, shakedowns and, and uh, things from general dynamics. Um, but Connolly at the, at the Navy, wow. Fred Korth, I just found out, I think, prosecuted. Uh, or a after he was the secretary of the Navy or before it was the lawyer for Marina Oswald's divorce. I think. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. Is, there's too many small world. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dustin Russell wants to know what was John Connolly's account of the events during the assassination and how do his recollections compare with the official Warren commission findings? Well, I mean, he always claimed he was hit by a separate bullet. He never, um, 
acknowledge that he was hit by the same bullet. Uh, there's, you know, it's been debated for years because he turns around, he still has a Stetson in the hand that is hit by a, uh, the, the magic bullet. And uh, he's turning around and to Connolly claimed that he heard the shot, which means that it couldn't have been that shot having heard it and uh, that he was hit by a second, second bullet, which I, I agree to. Uh, we're on the same page with this, me and Connolly. Uh, he was hit by not that bullet that they claim uh, because you'll see if you slow down the Zabruta film, you'll see that when Kennedy is hit, Connolly is still holding on to the Stetson in the hand that will be hit, uh, which seems impossible. That actually, somebody asked that question. Do you know which frame that might be? Oh, I, I forget. It's either 312 or 313. Uh, but you can you can look at it um, and and play it through, and you'll see the Stetson uh, still being held in his hand. And Connolly said this, not me. I mean, you can look at the film footage, and Connolly was saying it without the film footage. He was saying, I was hit by a separate bullet which if you look at the trajectory of the Connolly wounds, that's all you have to do. It's not rocket science, folks. Look at the trajectory of the, just the Connolly wounds, almost straight down from the upper back coming out of the mid lower chest into the leg, into the wrist and lodges itself in the thigh. That's almost an 85 or 80 degree angle, Eric. But yet his wife, would not let them take the bullet after he died, apparently. Well, well, well she wouldn't allow the exhumation of the body. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, she refused to. And that could have been, you know, uh, for moral reasons. You know, I don't know if she was politically okay. doing it. I, 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 You may not want your husband dug up uh, from the grave. You know, I mean, think about it. I mean. I wonder why they didn't pull it during the autopsy. You know, or when he well, there were, there was it shrapnel. It's not the bullet. It's shrapnel from sure. the wounds that he received. It's there's bullet there's bullet parts and metal in his wrist and thigh that add up to the weight of more than it's missing from three ninety nine. You don't need all this bubamices to disparage three ninety nine. You can merely look at the X rays of John Connolly to see that the amount of shrapnel in John Connolly weighs more than the amount of metal missing from 399 thereby destroying again another warren commission myth there's different ways to destroy the warren commission and john Connolly's uh, uh body is easier to explain for me personally than any of these other things that destroy the warren commission there's many ways to destroy the warren commission but the fact that uh, Connolly has more shrapnel in his body than is missing from 399 is indicative that he was hit by another bullet. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. And if he's hit by another bullet, where is that bullet coming from at that angle? The only place it could come from is the rooftop of the Texas School Book Depository, where they find a 302 British Enfield. And that's actually somebody's question. How come the rifles on the roof were, was not investigated? And, and not investigated by who? By who? The Dallas police are the ones that brought it down. There's a, there's a German Mauser that's found on the sixth floor. The Carcano comes out of nowhere. Whatever happened to them? Did they get given back to their owners? The Mauser and the uh, Enfield? Well, look. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, we, we know that they were pulled down. What, are they in evidence? I don't know. What happened, like what, Raiders Lost Ark? Or? I, I don't know, because <laughs> I believe that the British Enfield that they find at Fraser's house is that same rifle. I don't know if they find that rifle at... at at Frazier's house. I think that rifle on the roof is Frazier's, and that's why they drag his ass in twice to be brutally interrogated, and, and by Detective Rose, who will later be involved in the Thin Blue Line, the wonderful Errol Morris movie about Rose framing an innocent man uh, in the 80s, the same detective. Uh, uh, but they, they confront Frazier, and they said, you're going to the electric chair. You're going to the chair. You're going to fry. Uh, when you're 22 or 24 years old, I think he was around that age. That's terrifying. And then, oh, yeah. mysteriously, him and his sister, uh, Lenny Mae Randall, come up with the package uh, that Oswald brought into the car and brought to the Texas School Book Depository, the package supposedly being the rifle. The only two who say this are Frazier and his sister. Frazier's own mother says Oswald has no package. 
The, the guy at the loading dock who opens up the Texas School Book Depository in the morning said in a 302 FBI report that Oswald had no package. Frazier and his sister are saving him from the electric chair in Huntsville. They are saving his life. That package thing is what they came up with uh, to frame Oswald about bringing the rifle to work on Friday. If they don't have that, they have nothing. They shake down Frazier and they browbeat him into allowing this story to be put out by Frazier. True. Um, this is an, I don't even know if you'd have an answer for this. Rake Flyer, what is the most valuable item of Connolly's either archived or sold as collectible? Well, the suit is in the museum. I mean, that's why I mentioned the suit. It's on display uh, in the Texas School Book Depository Sixth Floor Museum and the Stetson. So maybe that's the most valuable regarding the assassination. Anything else? I mean, I'm sure there's other things like, for instance, well, the the, the connection between Oswald and, and Connolly has, has been uh, uh, explained by us. He writes a letter to to uh, uh, Connolly, he's secretary of the Navy, and uh, he will be secretary. And then he's not secretary. He's already replaced by Fred Korth. But when Oswald writes the letter, he he's trying to get his honorable discharge, uh, his discharge changed to honorable discharge uh, by uh, Connolly as the secretary of the Navy. He writes a long letter, and I think he's answered by Fred Korth, who, and he's not there anymore. So the second part of that story is very interesting, because when they say uh, the the deep state and the Warren Commission say that that Oswald is in Mexico City, he's actually in Austin, Texas, attempting to see the current sitting governor of the state of Texas, John Connolly. And he calls up and goes to the office and trying to get to see him to change his uh, 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 um, discharge uh, with this letter. And Connolly's out of town. We know this because the people who dealt with Connolly's office told the FBI that Oswald contacted them and wanted to meet with Connolly. Think about that, folks. This is a guy who's supposedly shot by Oswald uh, uh, later the same year. Yeah. It's um, a little much. Uh, <laughs> Vicky Ochoa, can we please have some Watergate episodes and how JFK were connected? We'll be you, doing you Watergate will. on you Sunday, will. starting Sunday, live. In Ohio. You will. I mean, how's JFK connected? I mean, he, he's dead by then, but there's, we will get we will get into the Kennedy the Kennedy's family connection to Watergate. We will connect the two dots. All right. Um, this is kind of a little outside of it, but uh when did you first recognize there was a conspiracy to kill JFK? Same as everybody else, when when uh, Ruby killed Oswald on TV. Yeah. It was just impossibly insane. Everybody in America thought the same thing. It wasn't just me. Everybody thought so. How does this mobster uh, get in to rub out the the assassin, quote unquote, of the president? In a, not not in a schoolroom, not at, at, at a warehouse, but in the police station. <laughs> it's, with I all mean, the press and with all, all the police all watching. Like, you, almost, hey, you don't want, Sarge, you don't want to miss this one. You better get down here because this guy's going to rub out Oswald. Now, I mean, you get these statements like the cops, you know, well, he killed Tippett. He deserved everything he got statements. But that doesn't explain how this mobster is in there to rub him out. All right. Uh, Steve Loaf, wondering if you heard the theory that Victoria Adams and Sandra Stiles shot from the roof. Probably not because I just came up with it, but I think it's solid. That's funny. Well, these are two secretaries who ran down the back stairs and didn't see Oswald. Nice try, but... Uh, that dog's not going to hunt. <laughs> it's worth 10 bucks, though. I'll give you that much. That's a good line. Yeah, thank you. Good one for Victoria. But uh, this is something the, um, again, the Warren Commission ignored her testimony. All right. Um, it's a good question, actually. What is the difference between a conservative slash extinct Democrat and a liberal? In Texas, it was huge. I mean, uh, you're talking about pro-segregation, anti-segregation, pro-union, anti-union. Wide gap. Big wide gap in the state of Texas. Um, again, Ralph Yarborough was a Kennedy Democrat. So you're talking about essentially the equivalent of a, of a modern day conservative uh, uh, within the Democratic wing. 
And then the liberal Kennedy wing would be about as far left as Ralph Yarborough would go, uh, which was about as far left as Kennedy would go. Uh, this was not uh, 1969, 1968. This was basically coming out of 1959, 1960 politics. Uh, so the words have different meanings than they do even eight years later. Um, the Overton but, window was a lot narrower back then. Um, anyway, the 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 wing that Kennedy was courting was the conservative Democratic wing uh, that was not uh, fans of his. Let me put it that way. Right, and and they're not that dissimilar to the Republicans. I, yeah, I'm saying that yeah, the, yeah, yeah. it was a lot narrower back then. I mean, things yeah. are far more apart um, at this. Well, point. he does become a Republican. He he switches parties. A so, lot of a lot of the South did. A lot of the South did. Um, Kim Opperman, waving from Ohio. Love you guys. Yeah, oh, we'll be seeing right. you this weekend, Kim. That's right. Uh, Nain Rouge. Let me see. Why did LBJ and liberal Yarbrough hate the other? Was it over the power of Texas Dems or something? Well, no, no. I mean, to be honest, I mean, LBJ was a scallywag and Ralph Yarbrough, according to everyone, was an idealistic, um, maybe a fool, but an idealistic true believer in liberal politics. Uh, whether you make Ralph Yarborough out to be an idiot is up to you. But Ralph Yarborough famously was uh, inundated by the Secret Service. He would not uh, go along with their uh, uh, shot from the rear from a building storyline. He would not buy that. And he said he'd been in combat in World War II. Uh, the smoke and the smell of gunpowder was at ground level. And they just kept coming in to browbeat Yarborough. This is in Washington after the assassination when the Warren Commission was getting their shit together to start uh, investigating this thing. Yarborough would not take the bait on this thing. He kept insisting that that smoke, that smell of gunpowder was at ground level. And, it, and smoke does not go down from a building, Eric, as you're well aware. Gun smoke, it only goes up. Yep. I mean, you uh, in theory, in theory, you should not be smelling gun smoke based on the structure of, of the Warren Commission uh, assassination. True. Um, let me see. Film surf. Do you guys think Connolly lied about looking at Kennedy after getting shot? Because in Zabruder film, Connolly looks back at Kennedy, but he claimed he didn't look back. Any opinions? Well, I don't know how far he looks back. He just he turns his head. The turning of the head is indicative that he hears gunshots. And if he if he is turning back, how could he hear the gunshots? He, meaning in the gunshots are or the sound of it is well past the gunshot itself, Eric. Yeah. So what is why is he turning? It's because he hears a gunshot and it hasn't hit him because his hand is still holding that Stetson. Yeah. And in, in fairness. I don't know if somebody lied or not lied because in the heat of the moment when you're just shots, I don't know if you're going to remember exactly. Oh, wait, did I look? Right, but I'm saying the, the yeah. fact that he's turning is after the sound yes. of the gunshot. Now he's turning. He must have heard it. Yep. Um, that's a good question by Robin Christmas. Did John Connolly continue to agree with the Warren Commission that Lee Harvey? Oswald no, he did not. He did not. Hmm. He did not. Okay. And it's interesting. Uh, Nain Rouge. Question. Were just the conservative Dems of Texas clued in on JFK assassination or were liberal Texas Dems knew it was happening? I'd say I only. Think any, I don't think any of that has anything to do with anything. I don't, this is not a party politics assassination in Texas. This is a military coup d'etat well above the petty politics of the state of Texas. I mean, LBJ is is has a criminal gang that, you know, extracts what they can from Texas. And Connolly's the governor and he's running certain uh, um, uh, programs himself, you know, to extract money from the great state of Texas. He buys a ranch that is so enormous. He becomes um, he becomes the the executor of an estate of a guy who's got the uh, largest ranch in Texas before LBJ. The guy dies and Connolly becomes the executor of the estate. And it's a, it's worth a fortune. That's how Connolly made his money. Connolly made his money on this guy's death. That's that's handy. Yeah. He never had to work again. 
he never had to work again. I think LBJ um, lost a crime partner when he became the executor of this guy's estate. All right. <laughs> Vicky Cote, and probably the uh, shot I used. Do you think LBJ and Connolly had a gay relationship? You know, who knows? I mean, uh, who knows what was going on there? They were unusually close. Um, I mean, sex was sex for LBJ. I don't think he cared. I think he uh, was surrounded by gay men. I mean, just, I mean, I don't know what that was about. I mean, Valente and you and you've got uh, what's his name who was arrested by the FBI, uh, um, Jenkins, uh, for blowing. Can I say that for <laughs> for performing oral sex on a Polish uh, soldier in the uh, lavatory of the YMCA, a, a few blocks from the White House. Uh, he was arrested by the FBI. Jack Valenti was uh, uh, supposedly gay, um, and he's surrounded by various gay men. Interesting. Um, yeah. On Rumble, Odysseus seventeen said, "Question: Was Connolly the one that LBJ co-owned an abortion clinic with in Puerto Rico?" Uh, from what I understand, yeah, they had cattle interest down there. They had a bunch of stuff in Puerto Rico. It wasn't just the abortion clinic. They had cattle interest in Puerto Rico. They were shipping meat into the military uh, through contracts uh, with these Puerto Rican cows that weren't the best stock. Let me put it that way. Um, and they had other interests in Puerto Rico. That is interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'd never heard that one. That's new. To yeah. Me. Yeah. Um, Nain Rouge again. Did Connolly ever appear before entering the limo that he knew something was about to happen? No, he did not. He did not. I, I assume that uh, LBJ said i tried to move you from that seat um i i believe that he knew that that argument ensued because originally it's supposed to be ralph yarborough so i think Connolly had to be surprised at the at a minimum uh that he was sitting in the presidential limo but if he didn't think anything was going to happen it's quite more prestigious uh to sit next to the president of the united sure. states than to sit back in that other car with lbj his crony you know what i mean yeah now I, okay this may be the dumbest of dumb questions and this is mine um is it possible that john Connolly did not actually know that lbj was trying to protect him behind his back but Connolly I, I, again i i don't know all i all i know is he was not scheduled to sit with the president you mm -hmm. know what i mean so all of a sudden to be told you're sitting with the president you know something cool. must have happened i mean lbj might have said you know, I fought to get you into the goddamn limo, John, to be with the president. I mean, he may have flipped the whole argument, you know, <laughs> but he certainly did not want to sit next to Ralph Yarbrough, who completely <laughs> undermined him after the assassination to say that he was he, he had the uh, microphone from the Secret Service draped over the seat blocks and blocks away from uh, Dealey Plaza. He uh, the guy who dove over the uh, uh, Secret Service agent. Uh, you know, smothered him. The, he said the guy never came over the top of the thing. It was a story that they made up. Uh, he's sitting there with his wife and Ralph Yarborough. Uh, Yarborough is a witness to the entire events in the LBJ car. Uh, honestly, he, he said that LBJ had his head down the entire time with the coiled microphone over the back seat from the, uh, uh, po the police radio that the Secret Service uh, band was on. That's weird. That's weird. Did Yarborough um, suspect it was only Oswald, or did he have a different opinion? After? No, he he felt the gunfire came from the grassy knoll. That's the yeah. problem with Ralph Yarborough and them. He he said it, I shouldn't have been smelling gun smoke. That shot was came from the front, and I smelled smoke. And and he had been in combat, just like Kenny O'Donnell and and the other uh, Kennedy aides also said the same thing. Yeah, a lot of these people were World War II vets. Yeah, but well, they knew that they were smelling gun smoke. And that is part of the Achilles heel, one of the many Achilles heels of the Warren Commission uh, analysis, because the smelling of gun smoke means the shots came from level. That ends the entire sixth floor window because there's no smell of gun smoke that's going to come down to the street. That's the problem with it. All right, uh, Johnny Z. Fradley question why do we never see other movies other than zapruder there are other films i know i've that. seen every one of them you got to look around man 
You got the Orville Nix film. You got the uh, a couple of films. The Zapruder's just the best one. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Same side of the street. Um, sure shot Sav. Guys, great channel and knowledge. I live near Youngstown, Ohio. Wondering why you guys are coming. Yeah, that's a good question. You. We're coming for you, bro. Because uh, you should be happy. <laughs> you should be happy because we didn't want you to get off your fat ass and go too far. So everyone who's a member, we're eventually going to come to your town. If you're a member and follow us, we're going to eventually do a meetup in your actual town so you don't have to hassle to get somewhere. So yeah, wherever you live, here. just let us know. Let Eric know where you live, <laughs> and we'll put you on the schedule uh, for having a personal meetup with dozens and dozens of fans who will drive to your location uh, so you don't have to do anything. Exactly. And Now, um, I know this is too far for this guy to make it to the event. He lives in Youngstown, but he may live in North Youngstown, and that might be too far for him to actually make it to the event at the Federal. Could be, but um, let's go ahead and talk about that. Oh, that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I'd have to say, beam me up. And I think these screw supervisors all work for the Internal Revenue Service. All right. And as you all know, Oswald is already there. He's there. He, got, he took an earlier flight, like a, a starting pitcher on a, on a baseball team. That's right. We, you know, Oswald uh, typically leads the way, and he's leading the way up there. And I'll pop this back up. You can always scan the screen. That'll take you right to oh, okay. All right. information on the events. That's easy enough. Andy, a little, oh, uh, this is going to be fun. Oh, yeah. This is going to be a good time all around. I know that there are some people here. We're getting really tight on it, so folks... I'd recommend book now because we're putting in the food orders and yeah. it's going to really suck if, you know, we'll, we'll try to have a couple extra, but you know, I, I'd hate to have you buy tickets at the last minute and say, sorry, no food for what you. What about meals on wheels? Can't we get some uh, uh, government program to come in <laughs> for the, for the last lingerers who um, they could share with us. They could have our meals. I'll yeah. give up. I'll give up my meal. Me meals on wheels. Yeah. Meals on wheels. <laughs> There was one time we did when we were at Sonora House, we had as part of our government grant, which was under the CETA program, the Compre Comprehensive Employment Training Act under Jimmy Carter, um, we had to go into nursing homes and perform. And they would do it. It was so crazy. We would just come in with all these crazy musicians and we were performing in a nursing home. So Frog set up his mixing board in the middle of a bunch of wheelchair people and a woman's colostomy bag broke onto his mixing board, and he was never the same after that. Wow. I yeah, yeah, can't yeah, say we, that I blame him. No, I know. It's got a squirting bodily fluids onto his mixing board. All right. And speaking yeah, of... Yeah, it, it, it was pretty... Uh, it was pretty... Ugly. was spurting blood when he was yeah. shot that day, so back to the... <laughs> back to blood and guts and, and, and <laughs> internal fluids. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, he... Uh, of course, they say 399 was found on his stretcher. You know, I mean, who knows? Now with, uh, what's his name, uh, the Secret Service agent Landers coming out with his crazy story that it was on the back of the seat, you know, and then he put it somewhere just to be nice instead. Of, the, imagine the guy finds those 399. He goes, you know what? I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to put it on the governor's stretcher and call it a day. I mean, give me a break. Hey, you know what? Um I, I'd like to think that everybody has 399, right? Here, here's 399. Right oh, here. wow. That's a, that's that's a right now, Andy. <laughs> By the way, a book I recommend, and this is also from the, the JFK Book Fund, Where Your Money Goes. This is the, um, the book written by Jerry Bruno, uh, which covers the stuff with John Connolly. Uh, it's also co written 
by an old friend, uh, Jeff Greenfield from ABC News. Um, and the interesting thing about Jeff Greenfield is he was an editor at National Lampoon just before I was hired. And he denies ever working at National Lampoon. And he is a big maca at ABC News uh, and a lefty uh, from day one. But the book uh, about Jer uh, written by Jerry Bruno is about him being the advance man for um, the Kennedys, both RFK and JFK. And in that book, he talks about the fight that he has. This is unbelievable. The fight that he has with John Connolly over the, like I said, the women's building versus the trademark. John Connolly goes to the phone in the middle of this lunch in Texas between uh, Bruno and Connolly. By the way, he's having lunch with Connolly and the lunch comes in and Connolly has a gigantic sirloin steak, uh, the size of the state of Texas. And he has a little hamburger for Jerry Bruno, who's eating a hamburger while, while Connolly's eating a giant steak. But uh, the argument ensues and Connolly gets on the phone and on the other end of the phone is Kenny O'Donnell in Washington. And uh, he makes believe on his end of the call that Kenny O'Donnell agreed to everything he was saying about the trademark. And he says, then it's settled, right? It's the trademark, right? And he goes on and on and on. And then after the whole thing happened, Jerry Bruno talked to Kenny O'Donnell and realized that Connolly had made up the entire conversation. Uh, that's not what Kenny O'Donnell said. Kenny O'Donnell says that we'll decide which building we're going to go with the women's building. We're going to decide this. And he's bullshitting Kenny O'Donnell on the phone, making believe that Kenny O'Donnell is telling him that he's correct. And we're going to go with his choice of the trademark. Uh, that's all in this book in the advancement. If you want to see where your money goes for this, uh, the JFK book fund, these rare books. And I think Eric might have found a PDF of advancement recently that he could put up for locals. Eric. It'll be up at 7.30 tonight. Oh, okay. For members, right? For locals members? Um, I think I put it up for everyone. But any, Okay. Any All right. Locals member. Pretty liberal of you, Hunley. Uh, I, I do that occasionally. We, we mix it up, you know, back and forth. But um, Okay. Well, then you guys can read the, the book itself. Yep. Um, be a free member or higher on locals. And you can free get free member or want to take you higher on locals. How, so anyway, these are the kind of sources where you could get these stories uh, if you get into the weeds on some of these memoirs. Now, you, who would think to get a memoir of Jerry Bruno, except for me, uh, which I've had for a while, uh, the advanced man. He has a picture on the back. I mean, here's a picture of Jerry Bruno, by the way, there's uh, uh, him talking about it. And, and usually he would work with the Secret Service hand and foot because they, Jerry Bruno talks about how the Secret Service goal was to minimize exposure to fans of the president. But Jerry Bruno's goal was to have as many fans or supporters of the president physically present with the president. So they were at odds ends, Eric, the two groups. Uh, he was trying to expose the president to more people. Secret Service was constantly trying to diminish the amount of exposure to the American people. So they would reach these compromises all the time, him and the Secret Service, about the amount of exposure that the president would have. It makes uh, sense. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it wasn't like a, a, they were at each other's throats. It was just it, they were doing two separate jobs. Yeah. And, and, and they had to come up with a solution. Yeah, they're, they're teaming up probably because I'm sure the Secret Service will say, well, could we put him there? Will that work for you and back and forth? Or Which is what I'm trying to say about the women's building. The Secret Service voted for the women's building. They said the trademark was indefensible. They didn't have the manpower or the capacity to guard the trademark with those catwalks and all the crazy entrances and exits that it had. And the guy fighting for that was one man, John Connolly. <laughs> I, what, what, I, what I suggest is that Connolly had two missions in this thing, if you want to. The El Cortez Hotel uh, in June 5th in, the, in, the, in El Paso uh, was when him and LBJ verbally worked over JFK for him to agree to come back to Dallas in the fall. The two of them browbeat JFK into agreeing uh, in that hotel room on June 5th uh, to return in the fall to Dallas. I believe that was part one of the mission. Part two, this is just Connolly. Part two of Connolly's mission was to get this thing at the trademark at the end. 
I think his extent of knowledge was basically, I don't want to know any more than I have to know. And I think the other side said, you're absolutely right. And I think that applied to everybody involved in this mess. Uh, and Connolly, I think those are the two things that he had to do as governor of Texas. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Let me see if we're still monetized. We are. Oh, it's a miracle. Oh. Act of God. Cross of fingers. All right. Okay. Well, we're being nice, YouTube. We're being very no, nice. I didn't say anything. Don't blame me. I didn't say anything. People get shot all the time. Did uh, Ken Simpson, uh, Ken, nah, sorry, Ken Simpson asks, did anyone ever confront Connolly about a statement, they're going to kill us all after his Well, I believe Connolly not believing the Warren Commission publicly was, a, was enough to verify that statement. I mean, he didn't say uh, he's going to kill us all. He said they're going to kill us all. He could have chosen the other words, but he didn't. Uh, and I think that he knew what he was talking about. Yeah, and he earned the right. And he also says all, <laughs> as opposed to him or you or the the, the woman sitting next to me. Uh, they yeah. said they, they're going to kill us all, all of us. That was Which, as a guy who shared a bullet with somebody else who got a bullet, it's a perfectly reasonable thought. Right, no, but I'm saying he. that's another way of saying I thought it was just him. Now it's all of us for some reason. <laughs> you know, when you say all, I mean, you, you know, there's some uh, logic behind that. Yep. Uh, let me see. Trish. They and all are the two parts of that statement that are of most interest. All and they. Agreed. Uh, Trish became a new member. Thank you. And then Mary S. gifted a membership. Thank you. And let me see. Woo woo. How would Connolly end up being a separate target as the infield is a very precise weapon? Um, I don't understand that. You're saying it's too precise to hit him or something? I guess they're, he's saying that if they're a good enough shot, I, I don't well, know. Well, it was a pretty good shot. They shot him in the back in a moving car going away from the building, for Christ's sakes, from the sixth floor. I mean, uh, I think that was a good shot, unless they were aiming for his head. And Or, or, uh, or maybe they thought it was Yarbrough, or maybe it didn't matter. Maybe maybe the memo didn't get to the people who were doing the shooting, and it was like, yeah. go ahead. I mean, it might it, it might wrong. not have been personal. It might be, you know, shoot the guy in the in fr the front seat. That's your job, whoever that is. I don't know, but it certainly didn't come out of uh, the Dow Tech's building from the second floor. It certainly didn't come from the grassy knoll. It certainly didn't come from the overpass, and it certainly didn't come from the sixth floor Texas School Book Depository win window because the angles don't line up. They simply don't. Yep, the roof works well. The roof is the only thing that works. And the, the, the finding of the weapon, you know, people have seen the footage. It's, it's, it's hard to find this footage, but many people who follow the channel have seen the same footage that I've seen of them taking the rifle down from the roof. It was newsreel footage, by the way. All right. Um, Alexander B., could Tippett have been a shooter oft later like Oswald would be days later? Um, I don't understand. You say a shooter of the, in Dilly Plaza? I guess. I no, I mean his. So. He was. It was quite uh, established where he was with his car, um, in that area of uh, of Dal outside of Dallas, across the Trinity River. All right, and now we're getting to some other parts of Connolly, other than that day. Okay. Question: I think you taught us that Connolly's daughter died in a hotel. Oh, I'm yeah, mistaken. I forgot about that. that Connolly yeah. was involved in his own daughter's death, or maybe LBJ was Well, involved. we can't get into it because the way his daughter died was the the word that Eric uses. Oh, man, I'm, I'm doing my best, <laughs> folks. I'm doing my best to. But, but, but do I don't believe that is what happened. I believe that her, her boyfriend husband actually did the, the deed, and it was ruled that she did it herself. And that's a subject for a whole other episode about the daughter. Um, yeah, it's it's really a sketchy operation, what happened with the daughter. Now, wait, was that Bobby Hale? Yeah, yeah, I think we covered him in the other uh, Connolly episode, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. He, and uh, the whole Hale, he, he will later break into the home. Yeah, dude, we went down this rabbit hole, remember? Yes, he, I he, know. <laughs> he forms a cult up in Oregon somewhere, and he broke into uh, uh, the, the mobster's uh, home in LA uh, with his brother, and wow, what a Papa, strange, 
Papa Pilgrim coming yeah. to Netflix near you. Here's Papa Pilgrim, but yeah, <laughs> hail. sounds like a Netflix special, does it not? It should have been. It should have been. I mean, this, this what a guy. weird story. Yeah, he he looks um uh, looks perfectly perfectly normal. Yeah, well, that's years later. I mean, uh, that's well, when he's <laughs> middle aged. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> he's still not dead yet. I don't, I don't think. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, but I think he killed his wife. I think he he killed her. I, I don't know what the real reason was for it. Uh, question for Mark, please. Why is Connolly's door not closed properly? Is it a message like the White Sox on the day? I don't. Understand. I think you might be talking about LBJ's door, uh, which famously was opened uh, on the LBJ car. The uh, uh, JFK limo is not open. You might be talking about the LBJ car. Mm, okay. Which people have commented that he was bailing out. Uh, there's different reasons or theories behind the opening of that door in the LBJ car. All right. Uh, John McMinimumman. That's a hard one. McMinimumman. Nin. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to say that name. But anyway. Sometimes in a conspiracy, not everyone knows every detail. Mm -hmm. So Connolly maybe knew about the assassination, but not where it would happen. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. Happened. That's been my theory since day one. Uh, I don't think he's gotten to the car knowing his head was going to be shot at. Uh, and nobody's got that much courage. Yeah, he, he didn't know it was going to happen uh, in that limo. I don't think that's too much to, to ask in terms of conspiracy. And I think he believed why he was asked to get the thing to the trademark for Christ's sakes. I mean, I mean, look at it from Connolly's point of view. You're told to make sure that this thing's at the trademark. The Secret Service does battle with you. The White House does battle with you. The advanced man argues with you over the trademark. A logical person would think if this thing's going down, it's going down at the trademark. That whole thing is involving Connolly. Right, Eric? I mean, he's told that the women's building is their choice, yet he battles to the death to get it at the trademark. A rational person would think that's why they're asking me to get it to the trademark. Yeah. No, I'm... Um, let's see. Big Bill 767, who tipped 1767. So there's something about 767 with uh, Big Bill here. Um, here's a yellow card to YouTube from his former soccer referee. Wow. Well, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah, woo-woo, question. So maybe the mission was to shoot both people in the front seats? I, I don't know what the mission was, but uh, that's the result. We know that's the result. We don't know uh, what the mission was. We could only see that the proof is in the pudding. He was shot separately, and Kennedy was shot separately. That's just the facts. Uh, what, what their determination was or why they were doing it, I don't know. I really don't. All right. Um, but we have to start looking at the Connolly assassination separately. And I mean that ballistically. Uh, but this is never done. Nobody ever examines the ballistic uh, uh, aspects of the Connolly shooting. And I've been talking about this for over 20 years now. Yeah, well, he, he, he's, a, he's a side event, not yeah. the main event. So it's kind of like the Tippett murder has been overshadowed. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, a lot of people talk about Tippett. They don't talk about uh, uh, Connolly being shot from a separate gun at a separate uh, angle with separate bullets that end up inside of his body because mm -hmm. it undermines 399. So uh, people argue, including Jim DiEugenio, they argue about the, the insanity of 399. We're way past 399's insanity. Way past that. All right. Um, Nain Rouge. Question. Was there any evidence whether Connolly or LBJ ever had contact with DeMorne Schultz, Paines, or anyone connected to... Well, LBJ and DeMorne Schultz, definitely, because the uh, Colonel Burris, uh, who was his military attache, dealt with DeMorne Schultz trying to bring in the ironically, the leader of Haiti, uh, the, 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 the next leader of Haiti that they wanted to install. Haiti is now completely in chaos as we do this show. But again, again, for the nine millionth time, uh, but also back in 1964, um, uh, DeMorne Schilt uh, was representing the governmental interest of, of Haiti and had been sent 
uh, after he handed off Oswald to the Payans, he went to Haiti. And he wasn't there for mineral rights, as he claimed. He wasn't there for oil. Uh, it was about installing a new regime in Haiti. And part of that new regime uh, was one guy, I forget his name, uh, Charles. Um, his last name was Charles, I think. He was brought by DeMorne Schilt. He was supposed to have a meeting with LBJ and give LBJ money uh, as a payoff. And he had to deal with LBJ's cutout, who was Colonel Burris. Uh, he was his military attache. Burris met with DeMorne Schilt and Charles. Uh, and whatever happened to that meeting with, with LBJ did not occur. But that's the real connection between DeMorne Schilt and LBJ. You know, so sad. Thinking about Haiti, which was once under Smedley Butler. Yeah. And uh, doing yeah. all right. I mean, that's the only way that. you're going to get it back together is to have a military incursion uh, into the island. And the, the Marines went into the Dominican Republic. And some <laughs> look, look at the results of that. We've got some of the greatest baseball players in history coming out of the Dominican Republic. That's, Mark you said, that's my priority. <laughs> yeah, if, baseball. If you said, hey. if <laughs> look you at said, Japan too, right? No. Yeah, anywhere, you will, <laughs> anywhere in the world. Korea. <laughs> the Dodgers are opening in Korea this week. Um, at three thirty in the morning, for Christ's sakes, I have to TiVo that um, against the Padres. We're opening in South Korea, uh, oddly enough, but because we had a war there, and once you have a war, the Marines who are left over teach the losers how to play baseball. That's part of the tradition of American imperialism. However, Haiti is just resigned to making baseballs with uh, women in a factory. They make our baseballs itself physically. And uh, the Dominican makes the actual players. And it's the same island of Hispaniola. And if you want to see, as sociologists want to see something of interest, uh, uh, look at the difference between these two cultures on the same land. Uh, again, the Dominican uh, Catholic, influenced by Spain. The Haitians have voodoo and a complete uh, savages. And it's on the same island. The Battle of Blood River uh, separated for all time uh, Dominican Republic from Haiti. Now, the French, when they had a slave revolt in Haiti, the French were the colony, uh, well, colonial leaders of Haiti. The French said, we're out of here. So all of these African slaves that they brought to the other side of the island, which is Haiti, uh, were left to their own devices. And the French went back to France. That's the reason that Haiti is so crazy. Uh, the Dominicans had Spanish rulers had Catholicism, had a structure, and are completely a different level of civilization compared to their island neighbors uh, right next door across the river. Very different. Very different. All right, Trey Ellswick, the uh, last question here. Question, do we think LBJ and Connolly came up with a plan, no. or are they useful idiots to a larger plot? Are we looking at chickens or eggs? No, 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 no. Useful idiots. I mean, he becomes president of the United States. Yeah. I don't know if that's a useful idiot. Very useful. I, yeah, very <laughs> useful. I, I mean, I think they had little uh, uh, parts of the plot. Like I said, in the El Cortez Hotel, they had to guarantee, this is both of them now, in the El Cortez on June 5th, they had to guarantee that JFK would show up. I mean, only they could have done that. And he did not want to come back. He's there in June, for Christ's sakes. And they said, you have to come back, you know, for, for another election uh, uh, trip. And he said, no, nah, I'm not interested. I got things to do. They would not let him out of that hotel on June 5th until he agreed. Uh, that could have been their assignment. And then, I, as I described, the things that Connolly did, the things that LBJ did are legendary. I mean, in covering up the goddamn thing. I mean, it was nonstop calling up the, you know, the chief of police. You got your man. Uh, his men are spreading out. They go. They, he sends in a guy to get a deathbed confession out of Oswald. He calls Charles Crenshaw. I mean, it, there's a lot of documented stuff on LBJ. We're just focusing on on Connolly today. Sure, sure. Um, Warrior Big Mouth question: Speculation, but when do you think it dawned on Oswald that he was the Patsy? The theater? The theater? Yeah, the theater. <laughs> Texas School, uh, the, the Texas Theater. I mean, when you look out, and there's 50 cop cars out there and the entire press of, of Texas. Uh, you might have a feeling that why are they picking on me? I'm just in a Texas theater here. I mean, if you buy into if you buy into the idea that he just went home, put on a jacket and went to the theater um, and all of a sudden everybody pounces on the theater uh, way far from Texas School Book Depository, 
you begin to believe quickly that you're the focus of their uh, their patsyism. Yeah, or you may not know exactly what it is, but there's something right. really wrong here. There's something <laughs> really wrong here. <laughs> and he start he started yelling, "I am not resisting arrest. I am not resisting arrest." Because he felt it was going to be executed, and he would have been executed if that large crowd was not outside the theater. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and and the people inside the theater too. Um, Bob Pacheco, Connolly and wife have always been strong against the single bullet theory. Yeah, why were they not pressured more to change story? Because he was a he was the ultimate martyr victim demigod. That's what I yeah. opened the show saying. <laughs> He was a demigod in Texas because he survived the assassination. He could have done anything. He uh, he was revered because he was wounded in the assassination with JFK. They couldn't yeah. flip him. Did he go on TV and say it? Yes. He did say he never believed the Warren Commission. He said it on television. He said it in interviews. He said it to Mark Lane. There's plenty of footage that he didn't agree with the single bullet theory. Simply because he got hit by the second bullet. It's called a license, folks. Yeah. If you get hit with a bullet yeah. incident, you could pretty much say whatever the hell you yeah, want. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, he was the governor, you know, plus he, you know, blah, blah, blah. But nevertheless, yeah, he never bought into it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and and probably good. So now we're going to shift over to locals. There's already some questions that are piling up on locals. We're going to have the after party there. I hope you guys consider coming over. Um, again, it's free on structure.locals.com. You can be mm. a member there for free. Wait, and can they subscribe here before we leave? They can. They can. Um, all right. All, let, all me, let me take out the bell of justice. Okay. Because we could use a few more subscribers to get this YouTube savagery off our back. So when I ring this bell, you hit. Is it a red button? Uh, there is a button below. It might be well, a different color for them. Oh, know. okay. Well, here it is. Okay, begin the begin the subscribing. There we go. They're off on the inside rail. The three horse. There he goes. Hunley pushes the remember to subscribe button. <laughs> and that everybody, we're gonna head over to locals. Hope you get there again. It's free to be a member there. Jerry Bruno book will be popping up around 7 30 tonight for everybody who's over there. Okay, and Friday, gonna we're gonna have the show at a Youngstown for these regular people, right? They can follow us. We're gonna have a special yes. guest. I don't want to tell you who it is. Uh, it's gonna be Watergate themed on thir on Friday, but we're gonna have free form Friday. Uh, anyway, we're just gonna touch on a little bit of Watergate at the beginning to kick off the 50th anniversary of Watergate. Mm -hmm. Uh, 1974 to 19, the 2024, where we are now. And then on the weekend, we're going to get into um, the beginning of a, of a long series on Watergate. So we'll see you either on Locals now, yeah. where all the cool people are hanging out. Right. Or those who just say, you know what? I'm not going to do Locals. Right. Now with you. All right. Well, we'll see you Friday. Yeah. That's no big deal. We don't, we don't take it personally. Pieces of shit. You can't fucking <laughs>